Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for what promises to be a very special episode of Celebrating the Art and Culture of Kentucky, Some of the Bluegrass is Black. My name is Emily Moses, and I am the Executive Staff Advisor for the Kentucky Arts Council. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third installment of this series that celebrates Black and African American artists who live in or are from Kentucky and make artwork across the disciplines and in a vast array of forms that relate to the lands we inhabit, those we call home, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. This series is one of several initiatives supported through a grant from the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation to enhance and increase the State Arts Agency's work toward racial and cultural equity in the arts sector in Kentucky throughout 2021. I want to note that throughout tonight's program, we will invite you to use the chat and to join the conversation, conversation and ask questions. You also can submit questions through the Q&A feature in Zoom. Additionally, if you are watching our live stream on Facebook, you can submit questions there that will be sent over us to share with our panelists. It is always my pleasure to welcome our series host of Celebrating the Art and Culture of Kentucky, Some of the Bluegrass is Black, Lexington-based poet scholar and professor Dr. Shauna M. Morgan an expert in the field of Africana literature and culture. My personal thanks to Dr. Morgan for helping to develop these programs and for leading us through this series of in-depth, intimate, and thought-provoking conversations. I invite you to join the Kentucky Arts Council and Dr. Morgan each month through November as we together celebrate and elevate Black artists living and working in Kentucky and those from Kentucky. I'll turn it over to you now, Shauna. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm so thrilled to be here for our third conversation. Good evening, friends. Thank you for joining us uh, for the third in the series, celebrating the art and culture of Kentucky. Some of the bluegrass is black. It is a rainy and stormy day today in Kentucky. Of course, our hearts are with the folks on the Gulf Coast uh, who faced Hurricane Ida and are still uh, dealing with that uh, tragic aftermath. And of course, our hearts are also with our neighbors in Eastern Kentucky who have already dealt with so much uh, flooding. Um, and so our hearts go out to everyone. We're thinking about you all. I'm joining you from Lexington, which is located on the original homeland of diverse native peoples, such as the Shawnee, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw and the Osage, who arrived over 10,000 years ago. The most recent among them were the Shawnee. Today, Kentucky is still home to over 25,000 native people representing scores of tribal groups. We must recognize the violence, including the deliberate and systematic destruction and ongoing colonialism endured by these indigenous communities. This acknowledgement is but one step however. So I will invite you to visit and support the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, and I will drop that link um, in the chat for uh, everyone to see and share widely. Uh, and we'll also share that on our uh, Facebook page. I also greet you in honor of the enslaved who lived in this very place where I now sit in the east end of Lexington. And I bring greetings in honor of my enslaved ancestors, likely Akan and Igbo people, and my indentured Indian ancestors on the island of Jamaica. I'm so honored to have with us this evening the inimitable Martha Redbone. Martha is a native and African-American vocalist, songwriter, composer, and educator. She is known for her unique gumbo of folk, blues, and gospel from her childhood in Harlan County, infused with the eclectic grit of pre-gentrified Brooklyn, inheriting the power, powerful vocal range of her gospel singing African-American father and the resilient spirit of her mother's Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw culture, Redbone broadens the boundaries of American roots music with songs and storytelling that share her life experiences as a native and black woman and mother in the new millennium, Redbone gives voice to issues of social justice, bridging traditions from past to present 
connecting cultures and celebrating the human spirit. She and her long-term collaborator, husband, composer, pianist, producer, Aaron Whitby, are called, quote, the little engine that could by their, quote, band of New York City's finest blues and jazz musicians, as written by the Wall Street Journal, uh, writer Larry Blumenthal. From grassroots beginnings at powwows across Indian country and in the underground clubs of New York City, Martha Redbone has built a passionate fan base with her mesmerizing presence and explosive live shows. Her debut, Home of the Brave, and I'm so proud to have a copy of it here, was called A Stunning Album. And the publication described Redbone as, quote, the kind of woman who sets trends. Home of the Brave garnered extremely positive critical attention, while her sophomore album, Skin Talk, I have a really beaten up copy of that here. It's seen a lot of, a lot of world. Skin Talk was described by J. Poet of Native Peoples Magazine as the soulful sound of earth, wind, and fire on the res. Skin Talk took Redbone's music to Europe and the Far East. The album Skin Talk and the Garden of Love, songs of William Blake, are recognized in the library collection and, um, quote, up where we belong, Native musicians and popular culture exhibits in the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., Martha guest lectures on subjects ranging from indigenous rights to the role of the arts and politics and Native American identity. And she includes workshops and motivational talks with students as a part of her touring schedule on numerous reservations, including Red Lake in Minnesota, Cherokee in North Carolina, Yuma in Arizona, and Menominee in Wisconsin. An exemplary ambassador for both Native and African American youth for the National HIV AIDS Partnership she was awarded the Red Ribbon Award for Outstanding Leadership. Um, currently, she advocates for Why Hunger's Artists Against Hunger and Poverty Program, which raises an awareness of poverty and hunger in the United States and abroad. And she's also an advisory member of the Man Up Campaign, the global youth movement to eradicate violence against women and girls, for which she served as the Indigenous Affairs Consultant and Advisor. She's particularly proud of her accomplishments in having the campaign's board of directors include an indigenous North American contingent independent of the United States to the roll call of 50 countries taking part in their youth leadership summit held at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa during the World Cup. I'm so honored to have Martha Redbone. We are going to start with a clip for those of you um, Hi. Uh, who aren't uh, familiar with her music, uh, we'll go ahead and start off with Caught My Eye. And we are the Martha Redbone Roots Project on violin. I have Mr. Charlie Burnham, and joining me on guitar is Mr. Jerome Harris. Uh, we're going to do a song uh, from a new musical that we're developing called Bone Hill. The name of the song is Caught My Eye, and it's dedicated to my grandparents. Dirty clothes from the mind, but a smile that warmed my soul as you held the door for me. Hello, man. So beautiful to me And we danced in the yellow moonlight Round and round, spinning, spinning, spinning Underneath the stars where you caught my I understand good kindness and humble ways be mine for the rest of my days. And we danced in the yellow moonlight. Brown 
I'm so pleased to welcome you, Martha Redbone. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. And thank you for uh, giving me some of your time and, and uh, inviting me to, to share a little bit of my story. Wonderful. We're so happy you're here and welcome home, virtually welcome That's home. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the, so the song we just heard, Caught My Eye, is from a recent work, Bone Hill, and it's dedicated to your grandparents, which sort of brings us to your ancestral homeland in, in Kentucky. I'm wondering, you've lived outside Kentucky for some time, even abroad in the UK, find your way home, whether it's in song or story or in hill? I think you take your home with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. I, I was very, very, very blessed to um, be raised by my grandparents. Um, I often think when, the, you know, when you're, when you're, it's one thing when your parents raise you, but when you have your grands, you're already connected to um, people who came before them. And so you're connected to your great grands and great greats. And I think, um, you know, for me, I feel like I, I've been blessed with that, you know, being closer to home, closer to the homeland, closer to our ways. You know, you get to hear um, a lot of the stories about, you know, people who were, you know, relatives who were around when they were little kids and things like that. And those are connections that I feel that I, I take with me all over the world. Those those stories that were, you know, were shared when I was a little kid. And then those stories that also get shared, you know, whenever there's a family gathering, whether it's for, you know, a family reunion or the birth of a okay. new relation or the death of, a, of, of um, you know, of a relation. I think that's the time when the family gets together and then shares these stories again, and you get to hear them over and over. And every year, you know, as you get older, you understand certain things in a different way. And and I think it's um, it's just a very special thing. And that's something that I've always taken with me. It's a funny thing that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Morgan, because I I lived in the UK. I lived in London, England, for eight years. And I didn't intend on staying that long. You know, I thought I'd be there for maybe a couple of years, but it became my home and and it was interesting uh how strong my connection to being back in the states was when you find yourself you know um an immigrant in a in a different country and so you it, and i don't know how that happened but you know you find that you find these connections with other expats as they call call it you know and you just end up meeting like a bunch of American people when you're living over there. And it's just so interesting. And I knew that I had lived there for a very long time because I, I got to the point where I started not being able to tell the difference between the American accent and the British accent, <laughs> you know, and I couldn't tell who was Canadian, had a Canadian accent, and it all started to sound the same to me. And even when when I would watch the news, like say you you know turn on the news on TV, and you hear the the uh, newscaster talk about you know whatever it is, whatever articles that they're reading about, 
And I couldn't tell if it was an American accent or a British accent. And that's when I, I knew, okay, time for me to come back home. <laughs> that resonates so much for me being an immigrant myself. But yeah, that idea of bringing home with you so that you can even if you live a transient life, always be grounded. And in the stories that you carry. And I, I love that. Um, and I'm so eager to see Bone Hill, the, the concert. You know, I've heard you talk about your people, your coal mining family, you know, as down home folk. Um, but your your musical audience and even your critics, you know, they've described you in so many ways. And maybe it's because they've seen you in so many different, you know, capacities. You know, I've heard alt bluegrass or you know they focus on gospel blues and so yeah. you know and and, yes. yeah. and i'm just wondering you know when you're grounding yourself and 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 sort of trying to anchor yourself in home how do you navigate the listening audience's characterization of you and your own sort of sense of of self in the work that's a really great question, and, and I don't get asked that often enough, so thank you for that. Um, thank you. I think, Thanks, one, of, I think <laughs> okay, Shana, one of the things that, um, you know, there are a lot of people who get paid a lot of money to put people in boxes and categories and label them. You know, that's a special skill that people spend a lot of time doing. They study it, and they, you know, that's what they do put people in boxes and categories and 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 because of that I believe that it's you know these things are important to identify things but what ends up missing is the ability to acknowledge that there is is a an organic cultural evolution of everything that is around us time changes times change, life changes. And, you know, as, as creation of all, as all of creation, especially us as the two leggeds as my grandpa would say, we're the two legged. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to allow the organic cultural evolution of the cycle of life. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is to not put every single thing into a box and a category and label because we were never meant to be that way. And when you have those labels and things, um, sometimes I often, I'll just cut to the chase, sometimes I often think that those fancy labels are a way to let people who um, would never normally embrace a black person's music and has a certain connotation of what they believe black music sounds like. So if if it's called all these fancy names, it will invite the person who normally would not listen to a particular genre to invite them in to listen. And the same goes with, you know, with any group of people who have a, style, a particular style of music. But I do happen to think that there is a great um, resistance to, um, you know, to this, to accepting that, um, you know, that bluegrass is black, you know, and that the banjo comes from Africa and that the, you know, black, the, the foundation of blues comes from the combination of indigenous and African traditional music. That is what the American blues comes from. And then there was the natural, organic, cultural evolution of immigration from people who came from Europe, who, that's why we call it folk music. It was all these yes. folks who came from, there were Spanish folks, there were British folks, there were Scottish folks, there were Irish folks, there were German folks, and they all brought the music from their homelands. These were all people who were indigenous to their own homelands who came here in search for better opportunities and the oppression that they were faced back in their own homelands. And they brought the music of their culture with them. And the sound that we hear is the sound of America, which comes from 
the combination of everyone bringing their music from their home. And that's the sound that we have in and around Harlan County and the, and the state of Kentucky in general and, and, and all of the South, you know, for, mm-hmm. for that matter. But we, we mustn't forget that, you know, this is a combination of all of the people who came to that mountain, all of the people including the original caretakers of the land who are my ancestors. Yes. And that cannot be erased. No book, no rewritten history, no census, none of this can erase that truth. And I mean, you can look at me and see all the ancestors in me, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, you see everything in me, you know? And, um, and I wanted to highlight that. I wanted to highlight the story of America. I am the story of America. You mm-hmm. know, my family have been here for generations and generations and generations, you know, and, you know, our my my ancestors, my dad's people, you know, came from Senegal, you know, that, you know, that's, that's all part of this region. They came and they were in uh, North Carolina, and worked there and there were a lot of people who were enslaved in North Carolina who were came from Senegal there was a, apparently a a ship a slave ship that came that came directly from Senegal so a lot of those people who were there were were who were in North Carolina are descendants from the, those ships that were docked in in uh, North Carolina you know so many uh, hundreds of years ago but these are all parts of the American story um, you know, that make us all who we are today. And, you know, I have, you know, me having living, lived in London, you know, my partner, uh, Aaron Whitby is, he's, he's British, he's, in, he's English and he's Jewish. His, his people are from Estonia and Russia mm-hmm. and Poland. And so, and they came fleeing from the, uh, the persecution of Jews and, you know, fled to England. And that's how they became you know, British from from that time, and um, and now we've been a team and married. Now uh, we just had our twenty eighth anniversary. We've been together twenty eight years. It's a long time. We were yes. so young when we met. You know, we were really really young. We're like, holy crap! Has it been twenty eight years? That's like longer than most people have even been alive. You know, but you know, and now we have a son, and so it's really important for our son to not have to feel that he has to choose, you know, who he wants to be and not be dictated by someone who doesn't even know us, just make a sweeping statement and overnight saying you're not this or because you are one drop of something, then you're considered this, you know, all of these kind of ignorance that, um, ignorances that um, prevent you from knowing who you are, learning your story, and accepting yourself, which is the key to self-love and, you know, humanity, the love of um, humanity. Absolutely, and em- embracing all of the complexity and, and truth that, yes. that you used, that there is. And I think that sort of effort to erase or silence that, right, has to do with um you know, sort of not wanting to, to know that truth, right? Right, that's right. And, and you talked about that, you know, that evolution. I have I have your first two, the CD, the cover is falling apart. <laughs> that's sophomore. a collector's item now. It is, it is, your sophomore album. And I, you know, I and I see that in the evolution of your work, you are doing this, embracing these complexity. And I'm wondering if maybe you can tell that a little bit, the evolution of your music, of your work, your 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 art in that way. Absolutely. Um, when uh, we were first, you know, working on material for for our project for our band. And, you know, doing the kind of rounds with, you know, having showcases and, you know, sending your music to record labels in the hopes of getting a record deal and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I realized, we realized very quickly that the music business is not about making music. The music Uh business is about making money. And 
the music business is not about creating art. It's about creating commerce. So it's no different from being a, a singer, you know, or a, a, a great rock band is no different from having a great hamburger. There's no difference. You know, each thing has to market itself a certain way in order for people to, to consume it. Mm. So once you realize that, um, you know, Aaron and I became uh, writers. We were songwriters, so we wrote and produced other artists behind the scenes, too, for mm -hmm. a very long time. And being the artist behind the scenes while we were developing the songs for me to be the front person in our band, we got to see both sides of things. We worked with legendary um, right, you know, legendary songwriters, and uh, you know, for example, um, the, the late Kenny Young, who um, wrote "Under the Boardwalk," you know, mm -hmm. by the Drifters, and then his best friend Scott English, who wow. wrote um, "High Ho Silver Lining," and he wrote "Mandy" for Barry Manilow, and so these are legendary mm -hmm. guys who, you know, are from the old school, and we learned a lot from from collaborating with them. One of the things we also learned was just because you had a record deal didn't necessarily mean you were going to be heard. Just because you record an album for a company doesn't mean that the company is going to release it. Mm -hmm. And in that, we had many, many friends who had record deals whose albums we never heard, which is devastating because we saw people you know, stuck in record record companies, you know, signed and couldn't put their records out. And they wanted to have their product. They worked really hard on these songs and they wanted the world to hear them and and things were being delayed and then eventually, you know, it t takes a very long time. It's a very slow moving machine for, for the majority, you know, but if you're lucky enough to get the machine to work for you, it can be really wonderful. Um, so we learned at, at that point behind the scenes that you know, there were many people who did not um, get heard, whose records never came out. And we wanted our record to come out. So we made the decision that because of that, because for that reason and also for other reasons, you know, I had a, I had a calling, I guess that's the word, you know, people use, but I always felt inside that I had to keep a connection to home I wanted to be able to, um, you know, champion causes that I believed in, you know, that I still believe in. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to hear from people whose voices, who didn't have a voice, who feel that they don't have a voice. You know, people who were erased, people who, like myself, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a mixed, you know, and have a mixed background, people don't accept you're too light or you're too dark or you're too not black enough or you're not native enough, you're not this enough, you're not, you know, you're on the East Coast native, you're not West Coast, you don't live in a reservation, you live in so you don't, you know, all of this kind of different things that were going on and and I, I you know, you're an urban native, you know, because you live in cities and all of these kinds of um, things and I felt like there were so many people who didn't have a, a voice and I wanted to be able to, to reach those people and I wanted to do music workshops and share cultural exchange and and just you know young people need to have a voice young people need for people to know that we hear you that we see you and that was calling me more almost like as music as a music educator and so we decided to become completely independent and formed our own label and we put our own music out and we got on the road and did it ourselves in a grassroots style. And I feel, um, I feel really, really happy with the decision. I feel like um, <clears throat> we created our career. No one dictated to us, <coughs> your song is not a, a top 10 hit single, so therefore we're you know, not releasing you and your, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff, right, like right. stories that we, you know, the kind of negative stories that you hear about when things don't work out in the music business. Excuse me. <coughs> so um, with that decision to be a grass mu grassroots musician, I felt liberated. I felt like a weight had lifted off, off my head of the pressure of having to 
look like a certain thing. You know, I had, you know, you had people telling you not to, don't tell me not to wear braids. You know, don't wear your hair. But why are you wearing your hair like that? Don't you want to be beautiful? You know, those kinds of things. Why don't you blow your hair straight? Why don't you have it, you know, all of this kind of stuff to like look more acceptable. And then I remember one day I realized so many um, black artists, black female artists are objectified and sexualized and and whether it's their choice or not or whether they feel it's their choice or whether they're owning that decision to do that you know that's fine but one of the things i notice is that the more successful the the black female artist becomes the blonder they become Mm -hmm. so when you look around the world at the biggest um stars who are african you know black um you know whitney houston she had blonde you know hair Mary J. Blige is blonde, Faith Evans blonde, Tina Turner is blonde, Mariah Carey is blonde, <laughs> you know, it just go down, you can go down the list, everyone just starts getting lighter and lighter and lighter to make themselves more palatable for, um, I guess, uh, the masses which who want to see, um, you know, this embracement or align, aligning, alignment with whiteness. and that's not that that just wasn't who i who i am Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and there are so many black women artists who are defending that who are aren't even preoccupied with that world but are really about making art that's going to reach and move people and i Mm -hmm. and i want to just put a pin in that because i want to come back to your performance at the folk life festival but but before i go there i you know your freedom you mentioned, right, with sort of coursing your own path, you know, allows a kind of innovation that that might not be possible when you're governed by someone who's concerned with marketing and profit and so forth. That's right. That's right. I mean, it it, it makes me think about. Yeah, that happens mm -hmm. all the time. If it's not something that um, fits the agenda of the the team that is um, put in place to market your work, you know, it has to be, you know, it's by a committee. So mm-hmm. I wanted to have that freedom because I felt that we had a, a deeper story to tell, have a deeper story to share, a deeper connection to make. And I wanted to, more than anything, I really wanted to find a way to um, acknowledge where I came from, the roots, the story. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I wanted to acknowledge where where I came from in the hope that other artists and other people and younger people and younger generations who want to express themselves through the arts, whether it's music or poetry, writing, or acting or whatever to dance, I want, I want it to, I wanted it to want people to feel that it's okay to tell their story because I think the, I believe that the individual story and understanding each other's individual journey and their contributions and their family's contributions who make them who they are, wherever you are in the world, is is a valid part of the story, you know, of the, for example, the American story. What's your story? You know, what brings you here? What were your what did your parents do? What kind of jobs mm-hmm. did they have? Mm-hmm. Everyone's story here has has importance. And I'm, I was hoping just to, well, I'll start with the self because that's something that I believe is the key to ending racism. You know, it's the key to ending this, uh, you know, these concepts of supremacy and things that someone else is better than another. No, each story is unique. Everybody's story is unique and it actually, and it matters. It's really important. And that's what the combination of all of us and all of our individual journeys coming together is what creates this American story. You know, the warts and all, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly for whatever it is, there is still um, part of the story that is, you know, that brings you to who you are today. Even if it's a tragic story, I'm here you know, despite it, as proof of my resilience to the past, to an ugly, might be an ugly or dark past. Or to Absolutely. The 
And those individual stories and that individual movement, right, against all those ugly things, you know, are, can, you know, help us to sort of think more critically even about the sort of larger structural things that govern us too, you know. And, and yeah, having that freedom, you know, I, I, I keep thinking about your, your 2012 album, Garden of Love. I mean, it remains a cherished work, you know, Hold myself, I was really intrigued by this, you know. And I'm, you know, I'm familiar, right? You know, old, old, old white English poets, right? But, but, and I was also familiar with the sort of social political complexity of Blake, right? And his work and thought about abolitionism and so on. But that 18th century mark, right? That 18th century English mark, particularly on the Appalachian landscape, just kept on coming back to me when, but after listening to the album, I thought, well, heck, these aren't Blake's works anymore. You know, this is Martha Redbone, right? Because <laughs> you transformed those songs lyrically, sonically, you know, just spiritually. Mm-hmm. And that idea that those stories, you know, that art can, can become and mean something, right, to you and become something new. I mean, it's just, it was so fascinating to me and and i'm you know i'm so curious about how you how you approached shaping those poems into something that became your songs and your family songs yes um i have to say um you know aaron i have to give credit to a couple of people as part of that because i i can't take the full credit on my own um my husband aaron uh, had you know on our shelves you know, we have plenty of books and we have more books upstairs, books and books and books. Um, my mother-in-law was an, uh, an editor for publishing, a uh, very prestigious, small but very prestigious publishing company in England. So we have lots and lots of books. And um, we, he rediscovered the, the, the Blake anthology on our shelves. I believe they were upstairs. And... Um, and he said, hey, some of these were cool. We were wor- already working on a kind of mountain record, we said. Let's make a mountain record. And um, and then he said, you know, some of, maybe we can, you know, set some of these poems. These look, these look pretty cool. Why don't we have a look through? So we sat and started, you know, looking through all the poems. And, and there were so many that were just stunning. And we were really blown away at the relevance compared to today. I mean, they're... You know, he's talking about, uh, you know, he, he his uh, disdain for the enslavement of people. Um, he questioned the idea of organized religions. Um, you know, he, he hated the idea of, you know, church and state kind of govern, governing, you know, people. He um, really wanted the world to have compassion for each other and empathy for each other. And, uh, you know, and here we are 200 years later in the same boat. Uh-huh. And, but the language, the language, the English language back during his time was so beautiful um, that we thought we couldn't put it better. And we, so we decided instead of just taking two or three song, two or three poems and setting them, we said, let's do a whole collection, you know, <laughs> do a bunch of some because there's so many that are just really beautiful and speak to us. So we did and we, you know, narrowed it down and um, the melodies came instantly. I mean, so fast. And mm. I usually like think and I have like my microphone up here, like what I have now. And I just kind of press the record button I just start singing away singing away and all of these melodies came out and um, and so we you know put a bunch of songs together really fast I mean when I say fast it was like you know just a matter of hours like a couple of hours wow. and then we called up our friend um, John McEwen from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band who we met a little while earlier in California and you know he's just a brilliant you know virtuous banjoist and when we met I said you're gonna help us do something at some point we're gonna have to work together you don't know it yet but you're gonna be working with us you know and he said oh okay <laughs> so we called him up we were thrilled and and um, 
said, hey, you know, would you like to produce? We found all these wonderful William Blake poems and all of that. And and he said, you know, well, let, let me hear what you have. And um, so we, you know, went over to his house and we brought our, our demos and, and he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And um, before you knew it, like in the next kind of like within a week or so, I think it had to be like a, at least a week or maybe oh. 10 days, I found myself in Nashville recording these songs. And and I so I have to also um, say that the magic came together, not only um, from its genesis with Aaron and myself, but John McEwen's beautiful um, arrangements of our of our demos. Um, were just absolutely gorgeous and I think uh, really helped paint the sound and those melodies that I sang really just I imagined th they that they might have been melodies that you know that my great grand my mm -hmm. great great grand would would have loved singing and and you know gone to church and heard a couple of them and you know so it was I, I had almost imagined that it could be music that you know my great great grand would have enjoyed when she was a young girl so i'm kind of conjuring up that that spirit in a way and we're gonna we're gonna hear uh, uh um one of those uh songs in just a, a moment but i have to say that that is what i hear right and i say you know i don't think about blake i don't you know all respect to the to the poet i know but it is <laughs> it is it's sort of like you know when you hear all along the watchtower you think hendrix not necessarily dylan you know but that's right that's right <laughs> it's yeah. i mean it is just a stunning work and we yeah, that's um, a testament to to blake's writing as well and um not only you know I mean, I, I took it and, and made it my own, but it's also the imagery. I mean, here's a man walking around who they felt was insane, you know, walking around the, the, the you know, the Heath in England and London and writing these amazing poems. And who knew that that imagery would fit so well over here? <laughs> well, we are going to uh, listen to um, one of those songs uh, that a beautiful recent uh, Tiny Desk NPR Tiny Desk concert. Um, we'll uh, listen to Garden of Love, and and that was just a wonderful collaboration too with with Aaron and Marvin Sewell and his ethereal guitar. Are. Yes. Um, so I'm going to ask Eric just to, to, to play to play that. Uh, yes.
it wonderful how many times I've listened to to uh, this thank you. concert. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, in that um, a few minutes later, after another song, talk about um, music coming from a vulnerability. Um, well, we we saw some of that in this, um, and the idea that you need the music as much as we, the listeners, do. Um, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that, particularly for this moment when we're experiencing so much collective trauma. Um, how has that um, shaped the work? How does the vulnerability play out in this moment? Yeah, that's a really great question. And um, I've been asked that a, a a, while, a lot <laughs> recently. Um, being a musician mm -hmm. and a performing artist, we, our work yeah. and our, our livelihood relies on the gathering of people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you move that from us and we have no work. So this pandemic has hit the music industry in ways that um, I'm not sure that we will ever really recover. I think we're going to become something new. I think we already are something different, mm -hmm. as you saw with the Tiny Desk um, Meets Global Fest. You know, that was right here. We recorded right here, you know, at home. And, you know, people loved it. Audiences love that, that because they're here in, in our house and, you know, and um, and it was really needed at the time because we were all indoors, you know, glued to screens and traumatized by so many things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, you know, it was great because it helps heal people and heal ourselves as well. And um, in that particular performance, we hadn't seen um, Marvin in a year and he only lives you know two or three streets away from us mm -hmm. but because of the pandemic you know it wasn't safe for him to come in here and it wasn't safe for us to be around him so um, that's something that's new as well you know having to find ways to feel safe in gathering in the name of music and healing mm -hmm. and uh, the other thing is is to how to um, continue to have value as a musician when, you know, musicians, we're always the, we're the essential workers that no one acknowledges. Yes. And, you know, all of the doctors and the nurses and all the healthcare workers and, you know, all of these people who took care of everyone of the sick during this pandemic but who took care of them? It was us. Because when you go into every hospital and when you when they were talking to these to all of the healthcare workers on the news and you saw all these things, what was going on in the background? Someone had a radio on and was playing music. You know, they played music to heal the sick, they played music to heal themselves. You know, you go into your car and you drive home and you turn the radio on and you're listening to music, 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 music. And at this time, when we were not allowed to go out, many musicians, what did we do? We put on, turned on our Facebook Lives and our other, mm -hmm. you know, uh, social media um, sites and hit the record button and we were playing music and, and jamming from home. And because of that, um, the world feels that they could ask us to play for free. Uh, wherever we are so we lose our value as workers they don't see the work that we do as work they see us as jamming and having fun with friends but this is our work yes and so that's the thing that has really changed because when we do ask to work you know and to be compensated for our work our work isn't seen or respected as work and I think um, that's the big change during the pandemic that I'm, I'm not sure that we'll fully recover from that, you know, that concept. Um, because it is work that we're, we're doing. Yes, we love what we do, but it's, it's work. It's a lot mm -hmm. of work. 
took a lot of planning. It costs a lot of money. We're, you know, they have we have all these like insider uh, musician jokes, you know, <laughs> about, you know, you you go into, um, you know, a kind of hundred thousand dollar studio. You have all of these equipments. You pay all this stuff, and and then it goes down on to record it and down into your phone into you know a ten dollar earbud and then you hear, you know it's like that. but um but all that to say is that's one of the things that i feel that has has changed you know the, the us as the healers we are i always felt that we should be acknowledged as essential workers as well um we should have been acknowledged as that because we do provide a lot of healing and we're still providing it as we're making our way through um, it isn't easy, you know, um, but, you know, we're making, we're making our way. We're making our way. Yeah. And it, it makes me think about the fact that, you know, even before the pandemic, you know, black women's work, black women's art, you know, face those challenges. Never seen, you know? never, never acknowledged. <clears throat> we've always, as, as black women, we've always been seen as a um, position of service. So, we're not even seen if you if you know what i mean the things things just happen you know things just happen things get done and no one knows that it's because someone is i mean hidden figures film was a great example of the invisibility and the erasure of of, mm-hmm. um, of black women um and just how you know it's just i mean the work is so critical and it it you you sort of bring me back to that that 2018 Folk Life um, Festival, the Sister Fire performance in DC. I mean, just that performance of drums, I think is what I keep coming back to because it is that healing that you're talking about, that music does, that song and that particular performance, right? The stage full of black women. That's right. You know, and the significance of drums, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm thinking about this, right? The significance of drums to both African and indigenous communities, you know, and on that stage, so so powerful. And especially now in this moment, because we're talking about the pandemic, but we have a sort of larger, you know, trauma that we're experiencing at the hand of white supremacist violence, right? Mm -hmm. And this, and especially now when, and across North America, right, you have this uncovering of the heinous crimes, the, the physical evidence, the uncovering of the physical evidence of those, the brutality of, you know, the those those boarding schools, you know, and this this you know, I this performance for me is so resonant because you have black women, you know, and you have this performance of this song, and you're thinking about you know, the crimes against Black and Indigenous people. And it is a healing song. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure I have this question, a question in here somewhere, but but I think that, you know, that it resonates so deeply with, with what you're saying. And that was such a beautiful collaboration. If, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about it and then maybe even share, you know, as we are sort of looking towards coming out of this, whenever that may be, if you know there if you're thinking about future collaborations or or even what work is on the horizon yes um that song drums is one of my favorite songs of all time and you know we say songs come to you in many different ways some some of them come out out of your own hand some of them come out of dreams and some are gifts that are given to you and that song was a gift that was given to me mm-hmm. that's a song that um was a gift given several times. It was a song that was written by um, the writer uh, Peter Lafarge, a, a song a songwriter. Well, they called him a protest songwriter, but I said he just wrote the truth about what yes. was life that was going on around him. And um, that song was also not only recorded by Peter Lafarge, but it was recorded by Johnny Cash as well. And, um, and then came back into my life um, as part when I was invited as a uh, to sing as a background vocalist on a recording, um, a, a project, a tribute project to Peter Lafarge's work on a compilation album, and um, I was invited by uh, Keith uh, Keith Sakola, a very dear friend who's an Anishinaabe um, mm. blues guitarist. 
uh, he who he also worked with John Densmore from The Doors, and it also featured uh, the late Floyd Red Crow Westerman, and I believe um, I believe it was Bonnie Raitt also was singing um, some backgrounds on there as well, and uh, Aaron, my partner Aaron Whitby, was also uh, played some uh, organ on on there, and and I sang the backgrounds. And um, when we recorded that song, the words were so profound. And this was back in 2005 or something like that, 2005 or 2006. Um, I'm probably getting the year wrong, but it's around that time. And uh, that song became a part of my repertoire since then, because I and we we played it at a few festivals, and elders came up to me and said, "Hey." Hey Martha, that song you keep singing that song. You keep telling our story, you know. You keep doing that. Don't you know? That's a beautiful song, and and so I did, and I would you know share this information as well. And I said I'll keep singing it because the elders tell me to keep singing that song, yes. sharing our story because people don't know that these things went on. Mm-hmm. And so many people don't know. So much of American history is not to- taught in schools, and what little was taught in schools was a lie. So I felt I'll just keep on singing that song. Um, And now, finally this year, 2021, um, it's now um, was written in the, I think it was written in the New York Times where people have uncovered the Kamloops in Canada and all the the residential boarding schools. It started being 200 and something uh, graves to now over 2,000 and more Mm -hmm. to come. Um, I also serve on the board of the Carlisle Indian School Project, who um, we're um, working on building a, a learning center um, just outside of the uh, Carlisle um, School grounds out in um, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting when the world finally knows what we've all been saying for years. It's kind of like, I feel the same way about, you know, the pipeline and, and, uh, you know, and, and all of the things that are going on. These are things that we've all been talking about for decades. You know, we've, we've all known it, but then once you see it gets into the social media and starts to spread and other people start talking about it, then it's like, wow, it's so interesting when it finally, you know, so we've been trying to tell you this for like 20 years, like, you know, but it takes that long to catch on. And I think uh, that's the power and the beauty in social media and being able to share um, really important information, you know, in a a fast way, a faster way. Mm -hmm. So because of that, now I think, the awareness of what happened in these residential schools and the horrors and things are brought are brought to light. High time, long overdue. Yes, yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. Um, I want to be mindful of of our time, although I could talk to you all evening. <laughs> I could listen to you we'll all. We have to evening. do a sequel. We'll have yes. to do a part B. We have to do like. A Does anybody have any questions? I wonder. Yes, yes. I'm just going there. Actually, Tamara Coffee says, um, every time I hear the opening of the Garden of Love, I hear voices from the churches where I grew up in Eastern Kentucky. Is that in my head or is that deliberate? It knocks me out every time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's deliberate because I think they're the same voices in my head too, Tamara. Exactly the same. Um, that's the sound. That That's exactly what you what you hear you know Mm -hmm. and it's um you know sometimes Mm -hmm. you know when i'm singing when i'm in it i don't i don't realize what i'm singing if you know what i mean i'm i try my best to you know um someone told me like you know study everything study what you're going to do and then when you're actually doing it forget everything you know Mm -hmm. and you know, and so that's kind of what I what I, I did, and when we recorded that um, song, the Garden of Love, we did it. You know, just in one take. Just you know, we recorded the whole album like that, pretty much. You know, and um, it was really, really, really beautiful. 
uh, Mark Stevens on guitar, um, John McEwen on banjo, um, you know, um, uh, Byron House on uh, upright bass. I mean, these are legendary uh, Nashville cats, as they say. So <laughs> I feel really um, blessed to have worked with them. And actually, actually, uh, Byron House is also from Kentucky. And uh, he's from, I believe he's he's from Bowling Green. And he's he's like just a legendary, beautiful um, bass player. And he plays with um, Emmy Lou Harris. So, yeah, really beautiful, beautiful people, beautiful musicians as well. So, yeah, I think you have to conjure. I think it's it's something that, you know, we're just the vessel. We just love, you know, I love singing. But, you know, for me, like songs are prayers, you know, so you're, you're praying. You know, we pray for everything. You know, we pray for peace. Yes. We pray for love. We pray, pray for hope. We pray for sorrow. We pray to grieve. We pray, you know what I mean? It's we pray for food. We pray for plants to grow we play pray for weather to improve you know that kind of stuff so i think that these are all prayers and i think when you're when you're looking at music you know from that place whether you're the lead vocalist doing it or whether you're an accompanist or whether you're the your instrument is the guitar or the banjo or whatever it is you know you're you're um the vessel that that everything that you know and that has come through you and that you've been influenced by no matter where you are comes through you so that's why i said and you take it wherever you go you know i'm you know raised from you know choctaw cherokee and african-american you know grandparents and you know and that's like in my bones and you know i could go to china and nothing would ever change that you know and you have to you have to to own that and be proud of that and embrace that and you know me living in new york city you know as a teenager like the sounds of you know the streets of new york city and like hip hop came out when i was you know a teenager that was like you know mind blowing thing that had not happened before and that's in me too you know and the music that my grand that my parents would dance to you know aretha franklin and james brown and you know, and, and they would have their, their kind of grown, grown, grown folks parties, you know, and play cards and things like that. Those are things that, you know, those are things that become a part of you, you know, that's part of who you are. Yes, absolutely. I, I, we're just so grateful that you uh, joined us this evening. And uh, we're wondering if you would um, share a prayer with us, if you Sure. I think um, Emily's just asked a question. That's out um, of here. Can you talk a little bit about the song God Created Woman? <laughs> <laughs> She loves that song. It's so funny. <laughs> you and my friend who's a poet, uh, Jessica Care Moore, she that's her favorite song of all time. And um, thank you about that. I love that song too. I love that song too, Emily. That song came from the idea of always hearing that God is a man, you know, that the creator is a man and who's to say, you know, what, what gender, um, your higher power is. We have no idea. It's different for everybody. It might be an animal, you know, we have no idea. So that I started thinking about, you know, some of the things that we're taught as children, you know, I started thinking about the, some of the stories in the Bible and, um, you know, and how people have put together all of these myths um, that are enchanting about a woman, what, a, what it means to be a woman. But at the same time, there's, um, you know that there's some kind of male under thing because they, st you know, there's always a, a little aspect of, of women doing something wrong or evil, you know, and that would never come from either, not a single woman that I know would ever say that, you know, so um, that's what that came from. It was, you know, I say, it's, you know, bl blinded by light, guided by force, descended from heaven was just par for the course 
double X chromosome. You know, I was just thinking about all these things and that was only part of the plan. And late in the night on the seventh day, his rest was so magical, but he still had to create, you know, and then, then I said, you know, if he's, you know, she's fearless and free, you know, and you find her floating on the beat of her wings, like an angel just appears, you know, and we say, well, you know, they're always saying that women are forsaken, like pity them and like throw them away because they're no. So I said, well, if that's forsaken, well, I must be mistaken because forget and then forgive me, you know, because God created woman. I might not like your story. I may come from a rib, but that's only a story, you know, you know, we made you. I'm the woman. We made you and we can be your lover, your mother, your sister. We can be all of these things, you know, and more. And so that's where that idea came from. It was about recognizing the power of, of being a woman. Wonderful. Thank you. We have another question. Um, uh, Christopher Cathers says, you participated with the Governor's School for the Arts recently. Yeah. Well, takeaway from meeting with the next generation of artists in Kentucky. I love them all. This is probably my third year now. I did one in person. Or did I do two in person? Maybe I did two in person. I, I might have done two in person and two virtual. I have to say I'll do anything for Kentucky. That's just, you know, it's for home. And, and I think, um, you know, it's a, such a beautiful program, the Governor's School of the Arts. I think it's really wonderful to have a place where young people, you know, juniors and seniors in high school can experience life being away from home for a little bit and, you know, kind of coming into your own and and being away from home can be really intimidating too. even if it's even a weekend can be very, you know, um, cause a lot of anxiety. And so to be a part of a program that offers so much support and and belief in in the arts, you know, with young people. It's so inspiring and they, they're they just really beautiful young souls and just eager and hungry and, you know, and full of light and positivity and hope and and have ways of, of you know, this is an outlet for them to continue the feeling safe to create art. And that's, that's part of the organic cultural evolution of yes. work that is what you're supposed to do they're yes. supposed to have places where they feel safe to be able to just create just create. and that's what i love about um uh, performing for for the students there wonderful wonderful thank you so much um i don't see any more uh questions here and uh, so we are just going to invite you to to close us out in in whatever way you sure. wish. So your song. I, let me see if I can um a prayer. Let me do my prayer. Hold on. Let me see if I can make um. I have a new system here, and only one thing works. Let me see if I can make this work. Can you hear? Do you hear like a little bit of reverb? Yes. Okay. Um, a prayer. So on, on the William Blake album, there is a prayer. There's a poem called I Heard an Angel Singing. And when we read that poem, you know, when you hear I Heard an Angel Singing, we naturally were inclined to make a hymn out of it. So, um, and this is a, a way that it has many meanings, but it, it's really about having um, compassion for for each other and, and all of humanity, all of humankind. So I like to leave you with that. I heard an angel singing when the day was springy. Mercy, pity, peace is the world's release. And thus he sang all day over the new moon hay to 
the sun you went down And haycocks looked brown I heard a devil curse Over the heath and the firs Mercy could be no more If there was nobody poor And pity no more could be If all were happy as we This curse the sun went down And the heavens gave a frown Down poured the heavy rain Over the new-reaped grain For mercy, pity, peace I heard an angel singing <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so very much. Uh, we are just thrilled and overjoyed, uh, Martha, for, for this time with you. Such a wonderful gift. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much to folks uh, joining us from near and far. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Martha, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. And prayers to everyone in the Gulf Coast and for all. Everybody, please be safe um, through this storm. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.